Wisconsin Eyes Campaign 2024 programming is sponsored by Wisconsin Counties Association, Nicolay National Bank, Wisconsin Hospital Association, Operating Engineers Local 139, the Wisconsin Realtors Association, the Wisconsin Laborers District Council, and North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. To support programs like this, please consider a tax-deductible donation at wisi.org slash donate or by texting WISI to 44321. Ahmad Rivera Wagner is the Democratic candidate for the 90th Assembly District. The election is November 5th. Ahmad Rivera Wagner, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Could you tell us what is your campaign's key message and why are you running? So one of the reasons I got into politics is I was raised by a single mom who had me at 16. We experienced homelessness for the first parts of my life. One of the things that changed our life was a program called Habitat for Humanity, where a local government, a local nonprofit, and people of all different backgrounds actually came together to build the house, including with me and my mom, that my mom currently lives in. And so that changed everything in our lives. Having the stability allowed me to be the first person in my family to go to college. The second is that my mom was a PCA, a personal care attendant, someone who takes care of the most vulnerable, people who want to age in place or folks are experiencing mental or physical disabilities. And she had not gotten a decent raise in seven years. And so I used to work summer jobs to help my mom out. And so one day over the dinner table, she says, what are we going to do? And she says, I said, I don't know, let's, let's Google a union. Uh, and so we Googled SEIU. Uh, 18 months later, uh, I helped my mom form her union. And she got the first living wage increases that she had gotten in her entire career and allowed her only to have one job instead of three. And so I've spent a career uh, working to make sure that government and public policy reflects the lived experiences that me and my mom had and so many people like us. And so I'm running to make sure that we get past the conspiracies and chaos, chaos that we've seen for the last several years and really focus on the issues that matter, things like housing and schools, funding them and housing uh, and, and other elements. Like to that. that point then, if you're elected, what's an example of a bill that would be a priority for you to introduce? Uh, one, I wanna make sure that we fully fund our public schools. Uh, we have for too long not been able to make sure ends meet even though schools are the place in which all of the policy failures and benefits go to, but we don't give them the funding to make sure that happens. Second is making sure that we have funding for housing affordability across the board. Uh, we just have both unnecessary regulations and we don't have enough incentives to do that. The second is making sure the workforce can unionize. Um, that too often this community that's blue collar, I represent Green Bay, from meatpacking workers to manufacturers, don't get to sit at the table and negotiate their wages and benefits uh, because of, the, uh, uh, of Act 10. And so, I believe in building an economy at all that's centered on strong schools, strong economy with a strong workforce, and a lot of housing. So if you are elected, you're entering the assembly during a biennial budget year. Right. States are projected to have more than $4 billion surplus. What would be your top two priorities for use of the surplus funding? Uh, housing and transportation. Um, we know that uh, to connect our communities, whether it's for businesses, colleges and universities, or for workforce, we need to be able to get there. So things like passenger rail, but also things like getting our bridges fixed and our, how our, our roads uh, repaired. We know that to get there, there is no Democratic or Republican road or bridge, but the, we do know that we have not funded infrastructure at the, that we need across urban and rural communities. The second is that we need more housing infusion funds for housing at every income level. Green Bay is experiencing a housing crisis. Um, we have less than 1% unemployment. Uh, people are flocking to the number one community to live in in the country, as recently designated the home of the 2025 draft. Um, but what we don't have is the housing to meet our workforce needs. So if you're a frontline worker to a C-suite executive, you are competing because we aren't building enough homes across the income spectrum. And I've spent my work as the mayor's chief of staff helping to do this, but we need some support. So I would support uh, infrastructure and housing. What about money. tax cuts or tax reform? Is that part of your platform in any way? Well, I, I think that we, we, we always have to 
taxed the right way. I mean, I do think that there is rules and spaces for people to pay their fair share. I think, unfortunately, property owners have been carrying the burden of a lack of funding from the state legislature. And so you're seeing municipalities red, in red districts and, and blue districts having to go to ballot referendum because they are not getting infusions of dollars. Shared revenue did pass uh, this year for the first time in about 20 years, but it was inefficient uh, and not enough to meet these costs, including public safety costs. So I believe that we should be giving folks a tax cut, but it should be infused by shared revenue, which would reduce the property tax burden, uh, making sure that the taxes that they're already paying are being put to the best use. You mentioned K-12 education as a priority for you. What do you think is working well in K-12 education, and what are some things that need to change? Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of that uh, is not being pioneered, but is uh, prominent in the city of Green Bay are community-based schools. These are schools that provide wraparound services for families. So when you go to school, you can get access to health care, dental care. There might be child care options. There might be supports for the parents or guardians. You're seeing these kind of community schools, how, how elementary is one of them in our area. And they are having wonderful outcomes because they're dealing with diverse populations and meeting their needs. So we really need to be able to get that done. What I think is a struggle is that teachers are not getting paid fair wages because we haven't fully funded our public schools. And so what you're seeing is that there's often a challenge to be able to get the amount of staff that we need to deal with the diverse set of needs that we have in the city of Green Bay. And so I can't, they're, they're trying, but they're often going to referendum. We've now had a referendum every two years for almost the last five because basic needs are not being met, including making sure our teachers get paid more. You can get paid more and, and some Chipotle's as a manager than as some of the staff or teaching professionals at our public schools. That can't be the case in a place like Wisconsin where we pride ourselves on having a great education system. So, What about our state's higher education system? Mm. Four-year colleges, two-year colleges, technical colleges. What does the future of that system look like to you and where would you focus in the legislature? So, you know, Green Bay is home to University of, Green, uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay, which right now is, has the highest of the new enrollees across the state, which is really exciting. We're home to NWTC, our technical college, which helps with apprenticeship programs to address our workforce challenges. Here's what's really fascinating, especially for our university system. We have reduced the amount of money that we've given them, and it costs more to go to school, while we're also simultaneously having a workforce challenging challenge. So it's literally more expensive, and less people are gonna be able to experience it than we have in the past. Uh, I've been knocking thousands of doors and people tell me how uh, tuition at the UW system used to be $500 a semester. Um, what I think we need to do is get back to funding it so it's easier for people to go to either two-year or four-year institution. And we need to make sure that we, the, the governor's budget just last biennium uh, had it more level funded. That was cut by the state legislature and made it a, a struggle for both their staff and their students. And so I really think that when I say fund schools, it's not just K to 12. I think we need to fund the robust and dynamic technical schools and universities that we have here. What do you see as the state's largest workforce development challenge and how would you address it? Truthfully, I think it's housing and transportation. Um, I think that we are uh, both uh, trying to grow that population of people addressing our workforce challenges, which is why we need robust K-12 schools, uh, two-year colleges, four-year schools. But even when we have the right people, they're struggling to find the housing that they need across the income spectrum. And then on top of that, when we wanna bring folks from different communities, Having passenger rail from Green Bay to Milwaukee to, that gets you to Minneapolis or Chicago, that allows us to really open up the opportunity for so many people to live in an incredible community like Green Bay. So I would say housing and transportation are the key figures to help us address our workforce challenges. I have a few more workforce questions yeah. for you. Investments in public, public and energy infrastructure grow our state's economy. This also provides an opportunity to invest in our state's workforce, but currently there are no requirements for hiring local workers. Mm -hmm. Would you support a state resident hiring requirement for state, local, and utility scale infrastructure investments? 100% yes. Full stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you, you know, I think what's that? A requirement? A requirement. I, I think that we do not, there is no incentive right now to build, hire, and uh, uh, 
connect locally, meaning that we can do it, people are doing it. But in other states, there are local incentive programs. It's not always a strict requirement. Sometimes it is a leg up, if you will, for being local. That had been banned, as you know, uh, for quite some time. But imagine what it looks like if we're you know, building pieces and widgets in, uh, in Green Bay, but we're also hiring those people in Green Bay, and that we give them a benefit for actually doing that work. To me, that seems like a reasonable framework that, frankly, many communities do this. Minnesota, which is having an amazing economy grow up um, over the last four to six years, including for large-scale businesses, often has both requirements for local, uh, access requirements for union, uh, um, prevailing wage. Uh, All of these things go there, and they're able to both make money and uh, reflect the diversity of their communities, and I completely support that. Employee classification is an issue in the construction industry. Some employers misclassify workers as independent contractors Mm -hmm. or pay them in cash off the books. This lowers costs by avoiding payroll taxes and unemployment insurance, and it puts compliant companies at a disadvantage when bidding on projects. Plus, those misclassified workers may be denied minimum wage protections or overtime pay. Are you aware of this issue and what should be done about it? Yes, I mean, generally without the kind of protections that I'm advocating for at the state level for workers, there's often room and space for both misclassification by accident or on purpose or you know, sometimes malicious acts by uh, employers against a workforce. Uh, we want to make sure, or I want to make sure, that we're advocating to ensure that workers have rights and have a seat at the table. Not every uh, mistake is on purpose, and, not, and things can be easily remedied if there are grievance processes or uh, procedures and tools for workers and employers to come together. But right now, there is, again, no incentive no infrastructure, and no requirements for workers to have a seat at the table around their benefits or their classification. And so I want to support a pro-worker agenda. You've talked a lot about housing. Obviously, affordable rental housing is an issue in Wisconsin. Some support rent control to maintain affordability, while others argue keeping that rent artificially low will decrease rental supply and increase prices. Um, Tell us more about how you see housing as an issue and if you support rental control or building more rentals as the solution. So I, I, I think we have to have a level of nuance, meaning that I think rent control at its best is a scalpel, not a hammer. Meaning that if you're talking about potentially people who are elderly or over 55, there are some conversations we should be having around what does it look like to make sure that they can live sustainable lives on the the limited income they may or may not have. Um, I do deeply believe that building more supply will absolutely change the nature of price. And we've seen that in Minnesota as another neighboring example. We're also seeing that in places in Texas, like in Austin and San Antonio, where when you build more options for people and there is deeper competition, it naturally brings down both rental prices, but it also brings down the potential prices of homes as well. There has to be more units. When there is a scarcity, whether you had rent control or not, it's still going to make every unit outside of those rent control go up. And that inherently is unfair. So I absolutely believe that building, creating more supply of rental housing is the key tool that we need to do to reduce rents. But I also think we need to make it easier Uh, And we have to make sure that regulatory frameworks are simpler, which are complicated and often city to city. I think there needs to be more robust incentives, particularly public-private partnerships uh, like university and student housing in downtown neighborhoods or working with for-profit companies like we have in Green Bay where we built a whole new neighborhood uh, supported by JBS of private dollars uh, and state and local funding where we're building over 200 units and two years. Um, so there really is a pathway here, and I think rent control sounds really nice on the surface, but as an implementation tool has a lot of limitations, but supply and reducing the barriers to building and building public and private partnerships really makes all the difference uh, in scale. Let's transition to healthcare. Medical systems are facing numerous headwinds in the form of inflation, workforce development, and issues around Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, resulting in fewer services and even the closure of a hospital system in western Mm. Wisconsin. What would you do to preserve access to care and prevent future closures? Uh, First and foremost, we need to make sure that we release the funds that were already allocated to address this issue in rural areas. I think this is the type of petty politics and kind of frustration that so many regular people have with state government, that they know their governor really well, they often know their mayor and the city council. Often the state legislature has been where good ideas go to die. 
uh, because they see this kind of petty politics, that because they don't like the governor this year, uh, that they're going to completely block funding for both PFAS and rural funding of hospitals to keep them open. I want to be an advocate that says those benefit everyone, and we shouldn't be paying politics with people's lives. I think these, some of these answers are simple. We could expand Badger Care, bring millions of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people into that system, and save millions of dollars in monies. This is common sense stuff. We just need to stop playing politics with what that looks like. I think people's lives are worth a government that reflects them and works for them. And I wish I could tell you that we have to have some complicated answer or there is some really uh, silver bullet. But the, the first is making sure people get the money that's been allocated for them. And two, that we take advantage of federal programs that reduce the cost of taxpayers but expand the amount of people getting benefits. That's something I would be happy in, to do. What about mental health care? What yes. are you hearing on that issue? It's a concern for Wisconsinites, for state and county budgets. Uh, what are some solutions in that area? So we see this as a major issue uh, in Green Bay. We're struggling with both mental health issues for students and young people. We're seeing a rise in homelessness where people related to connection uh, to addiction and mental health issues, and we don't have a strong, robust system. Uh, many of those are implemented by the counties because some small municipalities don't even have health departments. And so we're seeing one or two caseworkers for an entire county uh, is just unacceptable. On top of that, we have seen some innovations that are powerful, like mental health courts, where we can have incentives for people to actually get themselves on track with support and, and avoid jail. We've seen some success here uh, in Brown County around those issues. Those are not necessarily f fully funded or funded at all by state dollars. I think there is room and space for us to fund these initiatives, build more caseworkers, have smart innovations like um, mental health courts, but also change some regulations so that people who need help but may not be, and may be a harm to themselves, but aren't seeking that help that there are tools for us to use. Because right now it falls often too often on police, uh, who aren't the people who are trained or have the skills to do that. Uh, we need to make sure that there are stronger interventions in that space. So I would uh, have a comprehensive approach to addressing mental health. How should Wisconsin move forward on the issue of abortion? I think that we should trust women to make decisions for themselves. That is a decision between their health provider, their faith, and themselves. I think it is actually quite simple. I have no problem trusting women to make the decision. They have been doing that for 50 years uh, before the fall of Roe, and I imagine they can do that for the rest of the generations ahead of us. And it's a shame that we uh, decided to play politics with a fundamental right. Do you support any number of weeks as a limit? I think that, that, that under Roe, which we had before, uh, we had uh, absolute f fundamental access to reproductive care. I think getting into the weeks uh, is somewhat of a misnomer because even under row it actually changed over time based on the, the medical analysis that came from doctors and providers. And so we should leave it up to them and a woman to make that decision uh, who are looking for their health their health care in a really tough moment. And I think putting arbitrary limitations based on uh, layman's understanding of weeks would be unnecessary and unhelpful for reproductive health. You've already talked a bit about transportation. I just want to ask you about the pressing needs within this district and how important that they are addressed and for the state to keep on schedule with the reconstruction of aging interstates and significant mm -hmm. corridors of commerce. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Part of the reason why we have this great, great surplus, which I'm excited about, is yes, there's some f fiscal stewardship. It's that we haven't been funding some of these essential programming that, again, goes to blue districts and red ones that are, uh, that are conservative and liberal. I, was ju I just left a meeting w talking to uh, transportation developers of all different backgrounds, mayors, uh, town managers, uh, chairs of their... Um, their, their common councils, and every single one of them were worried about making sure they had the roads to withstand the winter, and that there was been funding has been cut uh, to every single one of these communities, rural and urban, urban. We need to make sure that we are, there are some really great programs that are already there, especially a rural streets program that has been uh, um, uh, capped right now because there hasn't been any infusion of dollars. 
I want to make sure that, at very least, that we can have roads to opportunity. And that means throughout our community, and I fully for support not only funding our current programming, but increasing it to meet inflation and the need, because roads don't last forever. Uh, you can't give it funding one year and let it fall apart the next year. We have to create consistent, predictable funding for municipalities, towns, and villages to be able to have the, uh, address the aging infrastructure in our communities. PFAS and other water contaminants are a growing concern for Wisconsinites. Uh, tell me how you see that issue and how you would address it. So, you know, in Green Bay, we're lucky. PFAS is a, you know, obviously a major issue for lots of families, particularly more rural areas that are dealing with different types of contaminants and different kind of actors that are uh, causing those contaminants. Uh, I obviously support the idea that we should be uh, allowing the funding that was already allocated to address these PFAS treatment and allow the experts and the local municipalities as partners to address those issues. We are hearing clamoring for both testing, for mitigation efforts, as well as recognition of this issue. Again, across uh, political spectrums, across geographic boundaries. And so I wish I could tell you that every answer is as easy as we should just release the funding. But the first step of many of these problems is that the state legislature has been in the way, and we should release the funding that's already been allocated for PFAS uh, mitigation efforts. And then once we get there, we can see what's remaining to make sure the communities that are impacted by this have the, the tools that they need to address it. We're down to our final two questions. How would you describe the leading differences between you and your opponent? You know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, well, I should say fortunate. I'm very luck, lucky to be in this community. I was raised by a single mom. We experienced homelessness. I've got to serve as the mayor's chief of staff. I've led major housing developments to address our housing shortage. I helped create the first ever municipal conservation corps. Uh, we are building a Green Bay for everyone. And that's incredibly exciting. So I'm very proud of that. My opponent is you know, more of what we don't want. Um, we've dealt with the conspiracy theories and chaos. She talks about the city hiding the word, she used the word illegals in our apartment developments. She says that uh, summers just get hot. There's no such thing as climate change, that she's proud that she's never worn a mask or gotten a vaccination. Um, these are culture war issues that the vast majority of people in our community are not interested in having any longer. They want people focused deeply on the issues that are in front of them. And there's a lot of them. There's funding schools and aging infrastructure, housing crises, union access, and even access to uh, reproductive freedom. And that is what they want. And that's why I have the vast majority, if not almost all major endorsements from public safety to uh, progressive groups who all believe that, this, that my candidacy is going to be a turning the page, a renewed focus on actually the issues that matter and not the petty partisan politics. So if you're elected this fall and you get a magic wand you can use in the state capitol to resolve one issue in a way that brings all parties and people together. What's the issue you choose? Ooh, uh, you know, I, I'm a nerd, so I'm going to say housing and transportation. I just think that uh, if we could solve our housing crisis, again, that it's affecting every community, uh, we really could just really a jumpstart, an already excelling economy here in Wisconsin, and things like passenger rail would be a game changer uh, for the Fox Valley and Green Bay. And these things seem very simple, but they've been, it's been very complicated to get them there. But with a magic wand, if I can get all the housing our community needs and the passenger rail that we, we deeply desire, I'd be the happiest person uh, in the world. Well, thank you, Ahmad Rivera Wagner from Green Bay, the Democratic candidate for the 90th Assembly District. The election is November 5th. Ahmad Rivera Wagner, thank you for talking with Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much. This programming is brought to you by our generous sponsors. Thank you for watching.